everyone. Welcome back to Come Follow Me with Fair Faithful Answers to New Testament Questions. My name is Jennifer Roach. I am so glad you have joined us today. As you know, we are going through the Come Follow Me meetings and looking at some of the common questions that come up between evangelicals and Latter-day Saints, kind of as they come up in the readings. Not trying to cause debates or, or fuel any of that, just trying to um, help you create better conversations with your evangelical friends and family so that maybe they can better hear some of the gifts that our faith has to bring. So before we get started today, um, I want to give you an update on the FAIR conference that is coming up August 2 through 4. I have some new details for you. I will be speaking Friday, August 4, 1030 Mountain Time. I would be delighted to see you there in person, um, but you also can sign up to stream the event. It's free to stream, but you do need to sign up in order to get the link. Um, go to fairlatterdaysaints.org. You can sign up there if you come in person. Absolutely, I would love to say hello to you. That would be super fun for me. Um, initially, my topic might have been of more interest to this audience. My topic was going to be the history of the relationships between evangelicals and Latter-day Saints. And spoiler, there are lots of ups and downs. Um, and I really do want to give that talk someday, but <laughs> instead I'm gonna speak on an area that I have a huge personal and professional interest in, which is sexual abuse in church settings. Might not sound like a fun time to you, <laughs> but I have a lot of hours of research into this topic and have a lot to say. Um, in this particular talk at FAIR, my plan is to talk through the five most common questions that come up on this subject, especially for Latter-day Saints. Some of the examples are things like does our church help abusers hide from the law? Or are there a higher than the average number of abusers in our church? Because I seem to hear about abuse all the time. I am working also on a huge um, question and answer page, about 30 questions regarding abuse. That'll be hosted on the FAIR website. So the questions I don't get to in this talk, um, they'll be hosted on that site. That's almost ready to go live. Um, I know it's not everyone's favorite topic, um, but I do have some really interesting original research as well as um, correlating, compounding other people's research that I think you might be interested in. Okay, moving on. This week's topic, you guys, I'm so excited. This week's topic, we're gonna talk about the rapture. Latter-day Saints are sitting at home going, what's the rapture? And evangelicals are going, oh, yeah, yeah, we love the rapture. Um, so we come to this. It, it, it comes up a few times in the New Testament, and we're actually going to revisit it again later this year with a slightly different angle. But the reason it comes up today is the Come, Follow Me readings this week are in Matthew 1. And in verse 23, um, this is the JST, we get... Behold, I speak these things unto you for the elect's sake, and you also shall hear of wars and of rumors of wars. See that you not be troubled, for all I have told you must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So that's Jesus speaking. And you will notice the word rapture is not in that verse. It's not in any verse of the Bible. It's not in the Bible's vocabulary. It's a word that evangelicals, it, it's mostly evangelicals, but some others use to apply to a concept that they believe they see in the Bible. And what they mean by rapture is an event at some future point in time where all believers in Christ will be um, taken up into the air. And this will begin a seven year period called the Great Tribulation time of much, much sorrow and suffering. And after that seven-year period, Jesus will return. So essentially, God pulls all of the believers off the earth, causes the earth to suffer greatly for seven years, and then Christ comes back 
to rule and reign in the millennium. That's the belief. It is a rather new belief. Um, I'll explain all of that to you, but it's a very interesting one. Um, this is God pulling their physical bodies out of the atmosphere and into heaven. And, he, and you might already see where we're kind of going with this. It's a, it's a very literal interpretation in a very spiritual realm. And so it gets kind of hard to wrap your mind around this. Um, you can look for the word rapture in the Bible. It's not there. You won't find it. Um, but it is but it is really a big and important belief for evangelicals. You will hear my bias on this coming through. You will. By the end of this, you will know what I think of the rapture. I don't say that to um, disprove evangelicals. This is an important belief to them. I'm telling you all of this so that you understand where they're coming from and what all of this even means if you hear them talking about it. So like most weeks, we start with some historical context. So if you go back in time, um, really about 250 years is about all it would take and asked Christians alive at that time what they thought of the rapture, they would have no idea what you're talking about. Um, the idea of the rapture is brand new in terms of history. It's been around for about 200 years, which in historical time is next to nothing. It's brand new. Um, and so here's how it came about. In the 1830s, a guy named John Darby is living in London. He is working at as a pastor. He starts out as a Catholic priest. He becomes pastor of a a group, they're called the Plymouth Brethren. Um, they actually prefer to call themselves the Exclusive Brethren. But if you've heard of them at all, you've probably heard them called the Plymouth Brethren. Um, and and John, he becomes, he's a Catholic priest. He leaves the Catholic Church and he becomes a pastor for them. Latter-day Saint friends. I know the thing that catches your attention in all of this here is the date, the 1830s, right? Because that's an important decade in our church's development. And if you listened to any LDS historian at all in your life, you have probably heard them talk about the extraordinary outpouring of spirituality that is happening around the world in the 1830s. It is often called the Second Great Awakening. There's a lot of other names for it. But it's this idea that all over the world, people were developing all kinds of new ideas. Um, it, it is interesting, the, the timing, my own personal belief on that is, you know, God sends an extraordinary, extraordinary amount of light to the world that shines, right? Other people pick up on it a little bit here and a little bit there. And a lot of religious groups kind of pop up around this time. It, it's just interesting. So Darby, he is, he's really an extraordinary man. Um, he is given a top rate education for his day. He comes from a wealthy family. They have a castle in England. They're, they're sort of lower royalty of some sort. Um, he, Darby has set up for success pretty well. Um, he goes on to produce translations of the Bible in English, French, Dutch, and German, all of which are still used today. Um, he he adds a lot to the theological conversation. His signature piece is about the rapture. Um, right around the time when Darby decides to quit being a Catholic priest, he has an um, accident where he is thrown off a horse. And he has this really long conv convalescence period where he's in bed and you know, he's got a big brain. And so he just lays in bed and thinks all his big thoughts. And, and that's sort of where he comes up with this rapture idea. Um, Darby, or Darby, he travels to America several times during the 1880s. Um, there, there's, there's some conflicting dates here. So we'll just say in the decade of the 1880s. Um, at one particular time, he travels to Missouri 
Um, this is 1880s, so the um, Latter-day Saints are long out of Missouri at that point. This is the era in which John Taylor would have been president of the church. So they've been out of, of Missouri for a long time. Um, but Darby travels to Missouri where he meets up with this guy named Cyrus Schofield. Um, there is also, side note, there is a Charles Schofield in early Utah history. Um, I think he's best known as a rail, as like a, a railroad builder, a railroad constructor. I don't know. Um, and I think there's a town named after him. I actually did some research to see like, are the two of these guys related? And I, I couldn't find it. If you're a family um, history expert and you know, hit me up in the comments. I'd love to know if these two men are related. Anyway, our, our Schofield for these purposes, Cyrus, not Charles, and he meets Darby and he is impressed with what Darby has come up with. And Darby is kind of, um, he's a geek. He's an intellectual. He loves words. He's not super charismatic. He's not a super great speaker. He's not a really great popularizer of ideas. He's just a great like comer upper with ideas. But when Darby meets Schofield, Schofield is all of those things. He is, he's charismatic and he's popular and he is a, a pretty big player in the in a broader theological world. And Schofield really buys into what Darby is talking about um, and completely spreads Darby's message in America long after Darby goes back to England. And the, the people who end up becoming sort of the the precursors to American evangelicals, they are heavily influenced right here in this era, era by Schofield, Darby sort of speaking through Schofield. Um, Schofield publishes the first modern study Bible. There, there had been a few other things that we might call study Bibles by this time, but his is really the first modern one, what he does is he publishes his notes, all of his commentary about the text um, right next to the the words of the Bible. So they're there side by side, just like if you've ever seen a study Bible, there's the author is offering you some thoughts on the verses that you're reading. And Schofield kind of takes this concept and, and runs with it. Um, the problem is, because of the era that this is happening in, I don't think Schofield means it to go down this way, but it kind of becomes this sleight of hand, and it directly impacts how this rapture theology plays out. So what Schofield did when he places his own notes and commentary next to the text of the Bible um, it doesn't seem very revolutionary today. You can go on Amazon and find 30, probably more study Bibles that do the exact same thing. And, and some of them are actually quite good. Um, this isn't a critique on the form. But it is to say, we modern readers, we can look at that page and easily understand this part is scripture, this part is commentary, they're categorically two different things. It's not hard for us to, to pick up on that difference, even if you were familiar with the concept of what a study Bible is. A person in the modern world could look at that and deduce it pretty easily. But in Schofield's day, this was a brand new thing that most people had never seen. Um, if it was contained inside the bound Bible, it was the Bible. So they take Schofield's interpretation very, very seriously, simply because it's embedded within the, the covers of the actual Bible. So when he writes about the rapture that he got the idea from John Darby in his notes, the Christians reading the Bible at that time, they're roughly putting his words equal with scripture. That, this is no slight on them, but the average Bible reader in that era is not very sophisticated and certainly not sophisticated enough to differentiate between the two genres of text that, that they're looking at. At this time, 
when Schofield's Bible is finally published, it's 1909, 8% of the U.S. population graduates from high school in that era. Right? So less than 10% of people stay in school long enough to get through high school. Most people are dropped out by eighth grade. Many, many people are done by sixth grade. There just was not a reason for them to continue going, and so they don't. So they can read. Um, yeah, their Ill illiteracy is a problem in that era. Most people can read. They've been to like primary, like grammar school, um, but they're not very discerning readers. They're not very sophisticated readers, and they really did not differentiate well between the commentary and the actual words of the Bible. And Schofield's Bible turned out to be huge, incredibly popular. By the end of World War II, he had sold 2 million copies of it. That's a lot of copies to sell of anything before Amazon, right? Like his Bible had a lot, a lot, a lot of influence on people. So that's sort of how this rapture theology got popular in America. And really America is just about the only place um, where you find a super strong concentration of it. You do see it in South America a little bit, Africa a little bit, Southeast Asia a little bit, um, especially as it has followed uh, missionaries of various denominations to those areas. But you don't find it there in the culture the same way that you do find it here. So fast forward from about 1909 to 1970, 60 years later, um, and a series of films is made that kind of dramatizes this idea of the rapture. There are four movies in this series. They're called the Thief in the Night movies. I grew up in a, a non-LDS church watching all of them, being terrified by all of them. That's a story for another time. Um, you can watch them on YouTube if you want. I don't recommend it. Um, the hairstyles and the, the fashion choices are pretty epic, though. So I don't know. That's kind of fun. Um, but they were it was four movies trying to say, like, OK, the rapture happens. And then what? What has happened to the people who are left behind? Which leads us to the 1990s, 20 years later, um, which might be the series you're more familiar with called the Left Behind books, which were later made into movies. But it's the same basic idea. They're dramatizing this idea that Schofield was writing about, that Darby was writing about before him. Um, I will, I'll will i tell you the story about a very, very dear friend of mine. Um, she was in the first ward that I was ever part of. She texted me one day and said, what's the rapture? So I, I gave her my brief explanation. And she said, one of her um, school-age daughters had checked out a book from the library called Left Behind. And, and the daughter picked it because the cover looked cool and interesting, but now she's reading it and neither daughter nor mother have any idea what this book is talking about. Um, evangelical friends, you, you may or may not know this, but Latter Saints have no idea what you're talking about. If you're talking to them about the rapture is not part of our theology, perhaps people have read the Left Behind books, perhaps they haven't. Um, it's, it just isn't a thing for us. Um, incidentally, it's not actually a thing for most Christians in the world. It's rejected by Anglicans and the Eastern Orthodox and Catholics. The three of those together make up the largest majority of that 75% of Christians in the world. Most branches of the Protestant world reject it. Um, but it got this firm footing with evangelicals and they can't let it go. So over the last 60-ish years, many evangelical leaders or, or people who are even sort of on the periphery between evangelicals and, and more charismatic leaders, they have made like actual date predictions on when the rapture might happen. Um, one of the most memorable ones to me was in 1988. Um, an evangelical pastor put out a book called 88 Reasons Jesus Will Return in 1988. I should have been skeptical because the title is cheesy, right? Like this isn't serious theology. But in 1988, I was a junior in high school and 
I too was not a sophisticated enough reader to to understand what was happening. And and man, I read that book and I was worried. Like what is what is going to go down? Um, it gave a specific date for the rapture, which obviously did not happen. Um, but some people, you can go back and look up like actual news stories about this. Some people sold their homes thinking they wouldn't need them anymore. Other people ran up huge amounts of debt thinking they wouldn't ever need to pay it back because they were going to be raptured soon and everything was going to be fine. Um, there were also some significant um, attempts at dating the rapture in the 1970s. When I was about 10 years old, so this actually would have been early 80s, but late 70s bleed into the early 80s, the church where I attended, they gave out these giant buttons and like written in some 1970s font. And it said, you better get right or you get left. Meaning you should get right with God before the rapture happens and you are left here on earth because then your chance will be over. Um, and we just, I don't know, we just thought that was normal. Um now I know my skepticism about rapture theology is absolutely coming through. I certainly don't think it's true. I absolutely reject the idea of a rapture. I, I admit to my bias on that, but I want to acknowledge that this is an important doctrine to evangelicals. And here's where it gets a, a, a little bit harder maybe, is that yes, this sounds crazy to Latter-day Saint years. But some of our doctrine and historical events sound crazy to their ears, too. Right? Rejecting somebody else's, like, really important, precious beliefs because they sound crazy. It, it isn't always the best, like, relational move, right? I'm not saying, oh, soft pedal and pretend like you believe what they're saying. Um, but just a right to write it off in some kind of way that says your beliefs don't actually matter to me, like they, that makes it hard to have a good conversation. Um, if you want to find an inroad on the conversation about the rapture with somebody, this is one direction it could go. Um, and it brings up a really interesting issue here. And we'll use the rapture to illustrate a point. So, um, one of the main verses that gets used for supporting the idea of the rapture is 1 Thessalonians 4, late in the chapter. This is Paul writing to the church in Thessalonica because they are worried. They are very anxious. They believed that Jesus Christ would come back in their lifetimes. But enough time has passed since Jesus' resurrection and the time Paul is writing this letter that some of the members of their church have already died. So they feel confused and worried because Jesus has not come back in at least some of their lifetimes. Some of their lives are over and Jesus has not yet returned. So they've written to Paul to help them out of this muddle with some version of the question, how can some of our friends have died if Jesus was supposed to come back before any of us died. So Paul, in his wordy kind of way, um, responds like this. This is, um, I think this is NIV. He says, brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the arch archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. 
So in context, you can see what Paul is doing here, right? He is helping them understand that their dead still matter. And that Jesus has not abandoned them. He has not forgotten them. He has not forgotten the plan. He hasn't turned his back on their suffering. Um, Paul is encouraging them to endure that suffering that they have now and potentially future suffering. Because the entire point of, of the letter is this beautiful figurative metaphor of Paul says, being caught up in the air. Paul here, he is trying to to reassure them that they will be reunited with their dead, all of them, the ones who are still alive and the ones who have already died, and that they all are in the hands of Christ. So people who believe in the rapture take the in the air phrase to mean something different. The Greek word here is just a very plain word that means the heavens, um, or slightly more literally, the clouds of the heavens. When someone reads this verse and believes in the rapture, they are reading into it this idea that when Paul says, you will be reunited with your loved ones who have died, as Jesus calls you to heaven and you will all be together forever, they read that as your physical bodies are someday going to levitate above the earth into the atmosphere and and somehow arrive at heaven somewhere. What they're doing is taking a very figurative thing, a, a metaphor, and they're making it very, very literal, right? So anyone who knows me has heard me talk about this, but there is an entire area of study called hermeneutics that is concerned with this. Hermeneutics is the study of interpretation, or how do we get the correct meaning out of a text? There is a variety of rules in in hermeneutics that help you do this. One of those rules is, that if a word is intended figuratively and you take it literally, things are going to go weird. The best example I can think of to give you is um, when Jesus says he's going to be like a mother hen stretching out her wings to to cover her chicks. This is a, a lovely metaphor. But if we commit the hermeneutical error here of mistaking figurative for literal, we would believe that Jesus is a giant cosmic chicken trying to protect baby chicks and and that he has feathers. Like, it starts to not make any sense. You sort of can get the same feeling with the rapture. Now, my dear, sweet, wonderful, amazing Latter-day Saint friends, before you get too comfortable, we do this too. It is not just evangelicals. We are all in the same hermeneutical boat, us and evangelicals together, probably every other um, group of faith too. But we also sometimes take vague metaphors from scripture and turn them into concrete proof of something literal and things get weird. I'll give you an example. You might not love it. (laughs) Fair warning, but this is an example of that. When we say there is proof of the Book of Mormon found in the Bible. So there isn't. There's no prediction of the Book of Mormon in the Bible. Now, if you're a good Latter-day Saint, what has just sprung to mind for you is maybe Ezekiel 37. And it is a great example of this. We Latter-day Saints read there about the stick of Judah and the stick of Joseph and apply that to the Bible and the Book of Mormon. It's actually a very lovely application of that verse. I certainly look at those verses and interpret that them that way with a lot of gladness. I see what's in the text. I don't mistake it for literally being what I'm going to apply it to. 
but it's a metaphor. And so I can play with it and apply it to the Bible and the Book of Mormon who are, are supposed to go together and be reunited in this way. But that's not actually what Ezekiel 37 is talking about. That's an application, not the literal meaning that's actually in the words of the text. For us to say that, we have to bring outside knowledge and belief into that verse and be able to apply it, right? We can't just read that verse, hand it to anyone on the planet and have them go, oh, that's about the Book of Mormon. It, they're not going to do that. It's, it, isn't, it isn't there. Now, for your own use, for my own use, for your spiritual edification, it is a great way to apply that metaphor, right? It, 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 we're applying it to something it did not originally refer to, but it works. And it has meaning in it for us. But if we wanted to say, what is Ezekiel actually talking about in that chapter? If you read the context of the chapter, the two sticks, they're the northern and the southern kingdoms that need to be reunited. That's the literal meaning of the text. We apply it, right? But we go a tiny bit too far when we say this is what this means. Now it's a complicated, it's a complicated thing for us because we have revelation outside of the Bible that tells us how to interpret the Bible. Right? People who only have the Bible, they don't, they don't have that. They still do it. You can see it with the rapture idea. Um but they don't have another book of scripture to point to and say these two are illuminating each other. They try to get the Bible sort of in weird ways to do that to itself and it doesn't, it doesn't work, they end up in weird places. Um, but there, there's two words you should know. One is called exegesis. This means figuring out the actual meaning of a text by looking at the text itself. What are the actual words Ezekiel is saying in chapter 37? And what did he mean by them? And there's another word called esegesis, which means you take outside information, outside facts or opinions, sort of read them into the text. So you read about the two sticks and go, oh, see, look, that proves it. It's totally correct to say we read about the two sets and apply that idea to the Bible and the Book of Mormon. There's nothing wrong with that. But it is too far to say this verse in Ezekiel, when he was writing it, he had in mind the Book of Mormon. There's no evidence of that in that chapter. It's going too far. You're making the text say something it doesn't actually say. Um, it might be a subtle difference. Hermeneutics is one of my favorite topics, so I don't know, all of that's for free. Um, we do have to be able to, to think both ways, though. What is the text literally saying? And then how are we applying it? What are we applying it to? Here's why I tell you all of this. And we've gone way over time <laughs> this week, I'm sorry. A lot of the misunderstanding that happens between Latter-day Saints and Evangelicals especially, is that both groups tend to think our application of a verse is identical to what the verse actually says when, it, when it's not. The argument will go back and forth. This is what it means. No, this is what it means. When a, a, a far more profitable path is something like there is a difference between the meaning of the text and the ways in which a text can be reasonably applied. We have very different applications for some parts of the Bible. Let's talk about why. Now that's an interesting conversation. Um, it says this, no, it says that. That's not an interesting conversation. Nobody ever got closer to Jesus Christ with that conversation. But getting curious with each other about how are you applying it that way? Why are you applying that way? Where, where, where do you see the literal meaning and how are you using that to illuminate some new subject? 
those are way better conversations to have. Anyway, enough of that. I hope you enjoyed this talk about the rapture. Um, I hope that when this topic comes up with your evangelical friends, you might be able to kind of stay centered in yourself while getting curious with them about why they think what they think. At the end of the day, for them, the rapture is something about Jesus Christ comes back and saves us. And yeah, we would have really different ideas about what that looks like and and how all of that is going to work and happen. Um, but there's an interesting conversation right there, how Jesus is going to come back. Like you and your evangelical friends could probably have a great talk about that. Anyway, enough of that. Please join me next week. We will have more fun stuff to talk about. See you then.